first of all, I would like just to introduce myself uh, with respect to this product. I'm from the automation industry. I'm uh, working with robotics and process automation. But privately, I have been really interesting. I'm a sports nerd. Uh, I'm a trainer in cross-country skiing. And uh, about one and a half year ago, we, a colleague came to me and said, Christer, shouldn't we do anything about skiing? And then, then I start to think, could we do anything about skiing? And, and then I was thinking, I mean, I've been working as, in, as a manager for many years, etc. And I'm thinking, now we should do this properly. We, we, we should check out who knows anything about skiing besides ourselves and just start. So we got in contact with the, the Swedish Winter Sport Research Center in Östersund and asked them, what do you want to do with the, I mean, building apps and using sensors or... And we just had a bra brainstorm meeting. And uh, we had this bra brainstorm meeting in, in May. And, and then we said, okay, let's uh, put on a lot of sensors on a skier, see if we can see anything. I mean, just a test. And we put on a lot of sensors, you know, and we got out the data and we looked at the data. But I realized quite soon, if we're going, going this way, it, we will completely fail. And this was a hobby project. There was no, I mean, no project. Uh, and, and, and the day after Midsummer Eve, I realized, couldn't we just take a phone? And we put, uh, I sent out my son, one of my sons, and, and took this uh, heart rate monitor belt and put a phone inside there and start to monitor the accelerometer values and gear values on the phone. And so, could we see anything? And then I looked at the data uh, and realized we can see something from the data, which really re uh, shows something about the skiing, not just distances, etc., but how you are moving. And then we started to look at this and, and, and applied some uh, mathematics. But, but the hypothesis then was that all the movement we're doing is manifested in the, in, in the, the trunk, I think it's in English, the ball in, this, in, in Swedish. Does anyone know trunk? Yeah. One more time. Torso, torso yeah. So uh, we, we saw all this movement in torso, even if you, and, and I will tell you a little bit about this and what's happening when you start to monitor this and what kind of applications we can foresee in the future. Uh, and the really cool thing about this, uh, for me anyway, is that I'm really interested in skiing. I've done Vasaloppe many times, etc. And I've been looking at Winter Studio in the Swedish television and see all these, you know, uh, stars. And now I'm talking to them and we're collaborating and I'm in the team. So we're collaborating with them. That's really cool. And I have their data. And you will see soon. Um, this is uh, the old-fashioned way of skiing. Uh, so things happening. Uh, and here is uh, from the lab up in Östersund. Do you know who, who, is, who this is? It's Emil Jönsson. He's the, the, the best skier in the world in, in sprint. It's a totally different technique. And you see all the sensors they have put on him. And then they uh, use video cameras and all this kind of uh, vision systems. You really have to go into the lab to really study the technique. Uh, and w w when we started to look at this and try to understand what is skiing, I mean, not just going out and skiing, I mean, it's for, for people that is interesting in movements, it's an El Dorado. It's really a lot of different. It's uh, different terrains, and conditions. It's uh, uh, multiple techniques and you change technique. And, and that's one of the things that we, I will talk a bit more about. And you involve almost the complete body. Uh, and we will talk about this uh, skating technique quite a lot today. Uh, and connected to sensors. This is an introduction. I will come to technology, I promise. Uh, but, but it's anyway interesting to see is that uh, they have a lot of different techniques. And uh, uh, 50 years back, they decided in Sweden to call it gear. I mean, with, you have the gear in the car and you change gear. And, and, the, and the, <coughs> the challenge then for, for a good skier as uh, Marcus Hellner or Charlotte Kalla is to use the best possible gear 
during the race so you arrive to goal as fast as possible. So where, do you, where, where are you going to change gear? Uh, and and uh, normally, how do you learn this? You often learn this by looking at other people or you're skating behind or skiing behind another person. But <clears throat> how to look at the strategy for select, uh, selecting the correct gear is quite difficult and you have no tool for it. And they do quite a lot of these kind of transitions. And what you often can see if you look at TV is that some of the skiers, they're really good if they're going behind another skiers. And it, it, the reason for that is twofold. First of all, it's easier to go behind someone else because then you can just follow the, uh, the, the pace, etc. But the other thing is that you steal the technique. So you do the same as the person in front of you. But if you're going alone, then you have to decide all this by yourself. And then you can see big differences between skier. Uh, <clears throat> and if we look at it from a, this is a, a course, a sprint course. Uh, you see you have very high speeds. You can up 60, 70 kilometers per hour. Uh, and it's very slow also. So it's up and down uh, like this. It's a sprint race here. Um, and, and when we start to look at this, uh, Sweden has a war with Norway. Uh, and the Swedish people know that. And the only way to, to handle this war is to, to be smarter. Because in Norway, all the good uh, athletes, young athletes, they start to ski. And they have a lot of skiers. So they have the talent base is much bigger. So the only way to, for Sweden to be competitive is to be smarter. To develop the technique, develop the strategies, the training methodologies, etc. Uh, so, if we look at skiing then, uh, we have training techniques and methodology, we have a lot about skis and waxing and you hear all that, uh, poles, shows, physiology, ways of working, and of course the skiing technique, and we will focus on the skiing technique here. How do you ski? Uh, so what we try to do is to move from this picture in the lab out to the field instead. So instead when you have been out skiing or you are skiing, you can get feedback about your technique, uh, like you have a run keeper or that kind of application, but you get feedback with respect to movement. And now I'm coming into the really nerdy part. This curve is the acceleration monitored by just a normal phone and we Put it like this so we can have any sensor we're using both phones and, 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 and advanced sensors or, or package in other ways. But this uh, curve just shows the movement left to right. And if you look at this curve in detail, uh, um, so this is one dimension. We look at the, uh, of course, three dimensions. You see here is one cycle from here to there and there is the next cycle. And this is uh, what we call the gear two. And you, you see, also see it's not symmetric. It's when you're going this kind of uh, uphill. Have you seen that? Going like this. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and so, so we can see here, and when I saw this, I realized I can almost understand this. And this is accelerometer values. And uh, if we look at this, is gear three. It's another uh, technique when you skate on each I don't know if I do it really good here, but you can imagine. Uh, and so, so, and it, that's, that gear is symmetric. Uh, so you can see, and you almost see that it's symmetric from how you move left, right. It should be. But one, one of the really cool things, the first time we tested this on snow, was after this uh, midsummer eve, we went to Torsby, and they have a tunnel where you can ski in the summer. And we went there for testing this. And then uh, I saw some elite uh, skiers from Norway there, and uh, had a lot of trainers, and I asked them, could we measure on your skiers? And I measured on one of their skiers. And, and then I realized the value of this kind of, of measurements is that when we measured on this guy, and it, it was this gear three that should be symmetric, we showed that he was much stronger on his left side than his right side. And I asked him, I asked, look, looked through the data and said, 
Uh, it looks like you're stronger on the left side than on the right side. And he just looked at me, what are you saying? This looked like if we, in detail, just to give a view, this is the three-dimensional acceleration round cycle for cycle. So, uh, and, and we can see that we also have some kind of variation between the cycles. It could, it of course, both depends on, on the accuracy in the measurement, but it also depends that you are not 100% equal in, in the repetition of each movement cycle. And, and when I discussed this, in fact, with the Norwegian people or the Norwegian trainers, they told me something that was really interesting. They this, this said, I mean, now really into details, I'm a nerd, I understand that. Is that, <clears throat> I can show the next picture. I mean, it was elite. Uh, and now when we started to really look at the data in more detail, uh, this is quite old data, but it's fun in a way to look at, is that uh, this is for gear, T, gear 2, and it's on uh, roller skis. And if you look at the data, uh, the data here showing the accel uh, acceleration here. So this, for example, is the acceleration in, in uh, sideways. And this is up and down. And then they have plotted it cycle for cycle. And you see this kind of, of uh, uh, butterfly uh, sign. And you can also see that they are similar. But here in the middle, it, it doesn't look similar. It's... Uh, it's like a comma, and then it's uh, opposite. What do you think is the difference here? And in the middle, it, this is acceleration sidewise and forward backward we are measuring. Why is, is it different? Exactly. So in, in two of the skiers, they are going with the left hand first like this, and the other ski is going with his right hand. And we just see that by monitoring uh, how the... Uh, then this is moving. Uh, and so this is, was, wow, some, some uh, simple analysis. And if we look at uh, how, how this looked like, if we, in detail, just to give a view, this is the three-dimensional acceleration round cycle for cycle. So, uh, and, and we can see that we also have some kind of variation between the cycles. It could, it of course, both depends on, on the accuracy in the measurement, but it also depends that you are not 100% equal in, in the repetition of each movement cycle. And, and when I discussed this, in fact, with the Norwegian people or the Norwegian trainers, they told me something that was really interesting. This, this said, I mean, now really into details. I'm a nerd. I understand that. Is that... <clears throat> I can show the next picture. If you look at this picture, it's also on snow, so it's a bit smoother. So can you do it on roller skis? You can, and you can do it on snow. And if you look at these uh, skiers here, you can see the variation is bigger on some of the people here, Jesper has a higher variation than, uh, than Stian has. And uh, is it good to have a big variation? Or should you have a small variation? And what the Norwegian, uh, this is a very tricky question, because what you want to have is the maximum variation, but still have a very good economy in the movement. And that is because you want to load as much muscles as possible with, the, with your movement. And, and you can imagine if, I take, if you are sewing and you're standing and doing exactly the same pattern, then you get very, very tired very, uh, very fast. And then you start to try to do the same movement but uh, using different uh, muscles. Uh, this is quite cool. This is from uh, the Swedish team. Uh, it's movement d DNA, I have called it. Uh, and this is really elite skiers. It, they, some of them are going to the world championships now. And the cool thing here is that uh, here, for example, is gear three. And this is gear three. And this is recorded on the same uh, place on a course. And you see it's the same movement, but you see different dialects, how, how, you, how you move. 
So, so this is kind, kind of movement DNA. And, uh, and here we see, uh, I think the, 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 the upper one here is a guy, Simon, and the lower one is Elim. And uh, they're quite similar, so this seems to be about the same dialect. So you can mathematically show that you're belonging to the same style, for example, of, of skiing. Uh, so, so this is just uh, data, and then we started, of, co of course, to, to see what can we do with all this. And what we are doing right now is that by classifying the movement, you can, when you're out running, for example, with your run keeper, you get a track you have been running. Now you can also show that I have been started with 10 diagonals and then have 50 polling and then it's uh, 5 polling with... Uh, a push, etc. So, so you see exactly what you have been doing. And then you come to this point of what you are doing. And you are doing it in one way, and I am, you are doing it another way. And then you can start to compare. Where, where did you change gears? Could you learn from each other? And I often do this comparison. Uh, have any one of you been into a competition of driving a car with as low as possible fuel consumption? I have done it once. It was on Volkswagen, and then they have a competition, and then you should drive a track. And you should, the winner was the one that drove this track with as low as possible consumption. And of course, I, I went, and I was quite successful, I thought. I had 0 0.42, and then it was a winner on 0 0.37. And then you start to think, what did that guy or, or girl doing that I didn't do? Was it just... Uh, how could I learn? And then I, I should learn from how did her or she or he uh, accelerated or when did they, they change uh, uh, gear? And this is the same. But here it's about coming and arriving to your goal as fast as possible. Uh, so that was some kind of, of macro analysis. And this is what we're doing now. We are going, going to Sochi and then doing analysis of the courses, and then so they could train and see, so when they're coming in the competition, they really do the best optimal choice. Uh, we also know that when you're going really uphill, you have seen this when they are skiing this tour de ski, and then this huge uh, uh, slope. And what they're doing, for example, when they're going on gear two, is that they're going with the left hand, and then they're very tired, and then they change and going with the right hand, first. But if we start to measure up the skiers, we see that some of the skiers, they're really left-handed. 95% left-handed and only 5% right-handed. And then, then, and then you ask them, why, 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 are you, why, are it, why, why, why does it look like this? I am so bad in right hand. I'm so bad. But you, you don't practice that. You can see that in the data. You never practice it. And then you can get quality feedback from your training. What are you training? To, to improve. And if you look at the best football players in the world, they shoot almost equally with the right foot and left foot. And you need to be able to do that to be among the best. And of course, the same in, in this kind of sport. Uh, then if we go down and look at now really details of microanalysis, look at the specific pattern. And have any one of you uh, been to racing Vasaloppet? Some people have. And, and if we look at that and saying, I'm going to go faster next year. I want to reduce one hour. And the question, how should I do it? What we know from, from physiology is that this uh, oxygen uptake, I mean, you, it's quite easy to come to your maximum. And it's difficult to really improve your oxygen uptake. So the thing you need to do to go faster in Vasalop is, of course, train a lot so you have only your max maximal oxygen uptake, but then is to, to, to pull more. That's the, that's the only thing. And, and you need to do it really efficiently also. So, so, so it's a maximum propulsion for each stroke. And, and <clears throat> here it gets really interesting. How many of you have played golf? Uh, it's a lot of people, but that's good. I also played golf quite a lot when I was younger. And the problem when playing golf is, say, you're standing there and you're going to, to drive the ball, is to, to, to really <clears throat> activate the muscles in the right order. And what do we call that? 
We call that timing. And you, you are in the zone, and you hit the ball really good, and it's... And suddenly, you can't hit the ball. Because then you say, I'm going to I need to pass that ditch and really hit it real long. And then you push everything you can, and, and you do something like this. And you lost your body. You only used your arms. And this is exactly the same thing we see in polling. So when your pole is up, create some energy, go down, and then activate your stomach, then your back, and then your arms. And then, like this. And if you have the timing, you, you, it's, you, you really get a good economy. And when we start to look at this uh, really in detail, here you see uh, I, the red one is acceleration up and down. The blue is acceleration sidewise. And the green is propulsion. You can say uh, down here it's, it's really forward, and here is the gliding phase. It's not really a good uh, representation, but uh, it doesn't matter here. But if you look at things left, right, what, 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 what is that? Waste, exactly, that's waste. So if you have a lot of waste, you, you collapse almost every time. You, you will not have any good economy. And then we look at that and you say, okay, you should maybe should increase your strength here. So you can, when you, so you're really stable and it's just going really, really fast. So this is from, from a 10 year old boy, this graph. This is from Daniel Rickardsson. He is considered one of the best polling technique in the world. And the really interesting thing is when we start to look at this in detail, is if, if we look, start to look at, at uh, this part where you get propulsion. So here he is coming, start to accelerate in the cycle. The pulls are down uh, here. And, and then we start to look here on the details. We can see when the different muscle groups are activated. So you can see the timing. So we see when he's coming from the up. We see when he activates his stomach. We see when the, the, the back is coming and when the arms are. are. And, and if I measure on myself, uh, and I, I will show you soon, <laughs> you see something totally different. So this is world class. Uh, this is uh, uh, a 15-year-old kid among the best in Sweden. You can see quite similar uh, things here as for, for, for Don Rickardsson. But you see something that is really interesting, and it really re relates to my own golf career. Here you see uh, a dip in propulsion. It, it's a bump. And you know, when you're a kid, or even if you're older, you want to have the same equipment as the best skier in the world, of course. And what, what this guy has, he has two stiff poles. So when he is putting down his, his poles with enormous force, he can't hold them. They jump up again. And, uh, and you have, who have played golf, what is happening if you are using a too stiff golf club? Uh, it could be sliced, but it's difficult to really get a, a good propulsion in that because you need to be really, really strong. And when I was a kid and playing golf when I was around 16, 17 years old, and I mean, you know, in that age when you want to hit the ball really long and all that stuff, and you used, of course, a stiff club because, I mean, I was young and strong. And then I realized when I have stopped playing golf on, on an active level that, that, that I was hitting the ball much better when I had a regular shaft. Uh, because I was not strong enough. So that is typically things we see now, is that uh, my fo I will foresee that you can buy different poles in different stiffness in the future, if, if, if uh, skiing is continuing to, to developing. But we see it in the data. Uh, but still you see a very good uh, re repetitive thing here. Uh, this is me. Uh, and what you see here is that uh, I can't use the, my, uh, my body really here of, of, of the energy. So, so it's like, 
So I don't, I can't get this as, a, as an elite skier, of course. And you also see that in the late phase of this propulsion phase, I'm using a lot of my arms. So very old fashioned, or like this. Instead of you see on TV, they just so you don't because the, the arms are very they are not very strong compared to the trunk and your back. Uh, so uh, what what we have done? The first version was an intelligent uh, tool we are testing right now, where we record the data, we look what what you have been doing uh, to develop your strategic skills or. Intelligent, more intelligent training. Uh, we have also looked at this symmetry uh, measurements, as KPIs. So, for example, if you're uh, polling and you see that you're always going to the left, you have an asymmetry. And of course, if you have an asymmetry in such a uh, quite tough movement, uh, you will get ache and you can get injured in the long run. So that is good to see that you're. You're too weak on your left side, for example. Um, uh, and the variability is how good are you on repeating your movement? Are you doing like this and next is doing like this? I mean, as a beginner, or are you quite good in doing the same movement? Uh, and we also look at relation between how much energy you put in with how much propulsion you get, some kind of economy measure. Um, and, <clears throat> and doing all this stuff, the only thing we have been doing is using a standard mobile phone, logging data, and done quite a lot of advanced data analysis. So what we have been doing is to automatically, uh, using machine learning in fact, uh, to, to, to learn the system to uh, detect uh, which technique you're using, and when you see which technique you're using, how to go down in details in each cycle to compare uh, between cycles the performance. Uh, <coughs> so uh, this is a, a, an example. Uh, uh, I mean, it's fantastic for me anyway. I mean, normally I'm sitting in a lot of meeting and the management team, etc. But this is really doing my hobby together with my professional. Uh, uh, capabilities. And, and this uh, last autumn, then we were invited by the Swedish team, so we went to Italy, uh, to Toblash, and uh, we were invited to take part in a run from, uh, we were, I was going by car, but they were sk uh, skating on roller ski from Cortina up to a place that is called Tree Saim, but it was on 2,400 meters. And we measured and logged all the information. Uh, and typically we can see where they were skiing, of course, with GPS data. But then we saw, we could see different, uh, for example, the first lap here, it was really uphill, it was using 834 left and uh, 528 right on gear two. And we can see detailed analysis here and go deeper into detail. So it's like a microscope, you're going into detail of the movement. And we have some different measurements, etc. Uh, uh, and we got, out, got a lot of, uh, of, 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 of information. And from you, that there are technology people or, uh, you know, technology and, and measurements, it's really interesting. But the question is, how could we use this also for improving? So from, we see this more as a learning tool. How can I improve myself? And learning, how do you learn? The, 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 the paradigm we are using now in learning is saying that, of course, you learn by looking at data. What did I do? You learn from your own experience. You learn from your peers' experience. And you learn from the expert. Uh, and, and if you could put this together in a tool so you get a learning tool to, to improve, what are you really doing? Uh, I think we will move really forward. Uh, so, so a lot of the skiers see, for example, that I'm not symmetric in my skiing. I could improve by training one side of, of my body much more, and then, of course, go faster. 
And, and we know the difference. I mean, if you are, as they say in TV, uh, Charlotte Kalla was 25 seconds behind uh, Björgen on 10 kilometers run. It sounds a lot, but 25 seconds is not much if you start to calculate in percentage. And then, of course, is you need to improve in, 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 in all things. And I think today, uh, a lot of the improvement is on, on, on technique. And uh, uh, if you go back in history, and now I'm giving you some stories, really inside stories, uh, uh, the Swedish people are in a way interesting in skiing. Remember when Charlotte Kalla won this uh, Tour de Ski. And then she was incredible. She was the leading technician then, especially in gear two, uphill. And you remember the scenes when she passed Marit Björgen, this really top Norwegian lady. What has happened since then? I mean, Charlotte has still, I mean, she's really fit. She's, I mean, maybe the strongest skier in the world, physiology, from a physiology. But the Norwegian, they have developed the technique. So, and we have, in fact, done an analysis of that. And what we can see in the analysis is, for example, when Charlotte is going to skate on, on this gear too, is that she's doing something like this. And then she pause, she take in her foot and she has a quite long gliding phase, while the Norwegians, they have removed this pause in, in the cycle. And, and we can see that by us, I mean, you, you, we as technicians, we can go into the cycles and look at where, where is the waste? Where can we improve it? You just see it as a, as a machine. But it's, 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 it's really fascinating. Um, so, we have some tools, we have a professional now, so we are doing this offline. We saw during these Swedish championships, we were running this on, on several elite skiers. Um, but if you look at the context, and now it's getting quite interesting. I mean, now I'm, I'm leaving the nerd part. I mean, I'm interested in skiing, as you have understood. But if you look at this from a more general point of view, is that, of course, we will have a lot of skiers connected, <coughs> or runners, or whatever. Uh, and we have quite a lot of sensors. The sensors we have been using now when we are, are, are doing our tests is, of course, this accelerometer, gyros, heart rate. We have measured uh, breathing, uh, etc. But you have a lot of sensors. And some of the sensors, of course, will be on the body. But some of the sensors will also be in the environment that you connect to when you're passing. So, for example, a, 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 a skiing course, you're passing a temperature meter or a humidity meter. And, of course, it's changing a lot during where you are on the course and you're interested in it, how your vaccine depends on, on, on these different uh, conditions. Uh, and then I put also smartphone, of course, uh, into... So you, you will need some kind of concentrators. And you, this one will, of course, connect it to the cloud somewhere. We'll do data analysis. Some of the analysis we'll do, of course, on, on, in the smartphone or in the device. Uh, and then you will have different services, of course. You can look afterwards. You have been uh, uh, skiing or running or what, whatever, looking at your technique and, and, and discuss with your friends. But some of the information also, and you have already seen that, is that some of the information will also be passed to media. So if you look at uh, NFL or something like that, American football, uh, uh, then it's a lot of parameters to comment. So instead of saying that the, the skier, he looks really tired, you see his head is hanging and it's his body, you will say that the movement cycle has shrinking a bit compared to the other skiers, so we can predict now that, etc. And then, of course, it gets more interest and it's more business, etc., into this. Um, something that I haven't. What's my time? It's okay. Uh, uh, something that I haven't been speaking anything about is, is now I'm just recorded data, I look at the data, and we have shown the possibilities. The next thing is, of course, giving feedback during your exercise or the competition. And imagine uh, you, you, all of us have uh, taken a golf lesson or a ski lesson or whatever, or we try to improve our technique. 
And when we do that, we are fresh. And, and, and the same is in skiing. But when, then you went out in the forest skiing and you have been skiing for 10 kilometers and getting tired, then you often go back to your old technique. And <clears throat> uh, if I relate to one of my sons that are competing in skiing, uh, it's quite interesting to, to look at him uh, and his technique. I mean, I, I must be the most analytical <laughs> skier <laughs> trainer ever. Uh, but what I can see, for example, when he is going classical skiing and he's getting really, really tired and coming to, to, to a, um, a slope in the end of the race, he almost never collapses. He keeps his technique <laughs> very, very good uh, uh, anyway. So it's only that the, he's, he's tired. But when he is <clears throat> when he's going uh, skating, and he is not in a top shape. But then, when he's coming to this slope in the end, the movement start to. Uh, he's very tired, and when he's tired, the movement cycle becomes really bad, and, and it's really a circle going like this. And you recognize this when you ski yourself. Uh, and what he needs to learn then is, of course, when he's getting tired, he has to slow down the tempo before he's coming to these slopes in the end to reach the goal as fast as possible. And this is some kind of intelligence. And what we can predict now is that we see that the movement cycles are shrinking when you're going. And we know you're you are very close to being, becoming very, very tired. Uh, in Swedish, stum. Uh, and, and if you can stop before you're getting this kind of collapse, then you will reach your goal much faster. But then you need to give this feedback. And of course, we can give feedback via uh, sound, of course. We can give feedback via vibration or, uh, you know, all this kind of, of feedback you can provide. But how to do that efficiently, we really don't know yet uh, how, how to do it. Uh, but uh, that I see as the next step. And when you start to think about this, it's a gigantic market in itself. Uh, when we were t starting to talk about this a bit uh, a year ago or something like that in Sweden, they said, ah, but this is just, uh, I mean, it's uh, just for fun and leisure. Couldn't you do any intelligent stuff with this instead for healthcare or anything like that? Uh, and, and I got that comment so many times, so I was started to really look into the business. Do you know how big the sport market is in Sweden? I mean, how much is the total revenue? I mean, it's around 80 billion Swedish crown, only in Sweden. And if we start to look in Sweden, how much export do we have in sports in Sweden? I mean, now in, 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 in sport equipment or sport services. Could you help me name a company that you know that are exporting sport devices from Sweden? Stiga, yeah, you're right. Uh, Stiga, and we have some few that are doing that. Uh, but if you look, if you compare to the interest that we are early adapter of new technology, it's it's really bad. If you just compare to Norway, we are really behind, and Germany, etc. Uh, and now, when we are coming into this e era of, I would say, Internet of Things, everything get connected, this will explode. I'm sure. We will see the next generation of tools. And the reason why we're so bad in Sweden, from my point of view, is that we have no tradition. And the tradition, uh, uh, and it's almost ugly to commercialize uh, sport things. And it's because every one of you that have been into to, 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 to a sport club, I mean, it's, you should do everything for free, etc. The tradition is not business at all. It's something completely different that we should be very proud of. But from a commercial point of view, this is, is not good. Because if you look at the research that they're doing or the development that they're doing, we are quite good. But nothing is coming out. If you compare it to, to, to the area you are working in, it's, that's business all the time. So here I think we have a big uh, potential really doing something. But it's a window of opportunity right now. Uh, and if we start to look at this kind of structure like this, you have uh, sensor systems, 
you have local uh, data analysis, feedback system, you store it in the cloud, you have different services, you connect it to uh, all this kind of, of uh, uh, social networks, etc., and you have to media. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's quite tricky to get this running, and it's a lot of, of things also to consider. Should you, for example, develop for this skiing application a specific hardware, or should you rely on the phone, or what do, do the user want? Should you be a so, truly software company, or etc. Et it's a lot of, of issues coming up. Uh, but if we start to start to think about this structure, we see the same structure in many areas. We see the same structures in, in home care, and then they put on a lot of regulations and security, etc., uh, integrity, etc. Uh, Well-being. I mean, it's a lot of tools coming now for stress management, etc. Also sensing different bio uh, data. Um, and this is a quite old slide, but I have kept it just because this violin player. And I read about a very simple, I got a paper from a colleague, and, and it was about learning how to play violin. And if you start to play violin, you, I mean, it's tricky, really. Uh, so some of you have, I'm sure, been doing that. But one of the problems when you're playing violin is that you get uh, tired. And then your arms start to fall. And then uh, the, the efficiency you have in, in learning is decreasing also. And then yes, they put a sensor here on, on the arm. So when your st arm start falling, it was vibrating. And then they increase the learning pace radically. And it, that's interesting. And I think when we do things, uh, it, it's really important to learn the correct movements from the beginning and not try to relearn. Relearn takes such a much longer time. But still these tools can't be like a straight jacket either. They must support learning. They shouldn't be guiding, saying exactly, but start to how should reflect on your on movement or your technique, etc. Uh, so and when when we we go back to this skiing product, you can think of how can you do this kind of project? I mean, it, you, you need, of course, the skills all of you have in programming, etc., data analysis. But I think the key to, to really be successful going into this kind of area is, of course, that uh, we have, uh, uh, for skiing and physiology, we have a guy that's named Hosey Holmberg. He is, I mean, number one research in the world in skiing. He, uh, he, he really knows about skiing, has no idea about uh, the things we are doing, data analysis, sensors, etc. We have been using a lot of elite skiers for developing this to see could, could we use it for elite skiers, then we should be able to use it for, 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 uh, uh, for uh, recreational skiers. And then, of course, mathematical modeling is really important in this case. We have used advanced methods to extract vital information from all this sensor data we have. Um, and then we have some biomechanics, we have worked with user interaction, and of course we have uh, programmers that have been working with this, try to implement it. And of course, when you have this kind of team that's very loosely uh, management and uh, financing, etc., is important, so you need bridges. So my task here, I haven't done any programming, I've just been how to get these people working together in an efficient way. That has been my task, to talking to the skiers and understand what they say and translate it into the mathematics and sensor data. Uh, so, so I think the key to be successful in doing this kind of application is to, to build these cross-functional teams. Uh, otherwise, you, it's, it's really, really, really tricky. Uh, so that's what I was going to tell you today. Thank you.